We're talking about resurrection power. He is risen. risen Oh, it's great to hear that. Why, it's no wonder in Philippians 3.10, the Apostle Paul expresses his desire to know the Lord. Do you remember that passage? That deep, intimate knowledge to know the Lord, he says, and the power of his resurrection. In Romans 1, 3 and 4, again, the Apostle Paul makes a similar claim. A holy declaration, he says, concerning God's Son. And of course, that's our Lord Jesus Christ, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord God, we are humbled to be before you, Lord, and to hold this word of God before us, our Bibles, that declare the great resurrection story of our Lord Jesus, that declares for us the victory that has been won at Calvary for us. And we pray now, Lord, by the anointing and teaching of the Holy Spirit, we will again be refreshed, taught, and challenged by the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. O oh, death, where is thy sting? The earthly tomb of our Lord is empty. Our Lord is now our heavenly, exalted, resurrected King who sits at the right hand of his Father on high. And I'll tell you, while there's power in the blood, and I believe that, there is earthquaking power in Christ's resurrection. You know, in Christ's resurrection, there really was an explosion of power. In fact, you could call it detonation. Uh, when Christ died on Calvary's tree, when he was resurrected, he bursted forth from the tomb. And you know what else happened, though, when the Lord um, died and was resurrected? The Bible tells us that there were tombs themselves of saints that were broken apart, and that, that dead saints rose up as well. In fact, let's just look at it. We'll eventually find ourselves where we need to be today. But turn over to Matthew 27. It's, it's one of those little sections tucked into the resurrection story, and it brings us in the direction where we want to go. And I just want to reference it. Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53, tells us about this amazing event. It says there, Matthew 27, 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and what does it say? From what? top to bottom. Who? By whose hands? I believe by God's very hands himself, opening the way into the Holy of Holies. And the Bible says, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies, how about this, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city, and they appeared to many. Now, um, does anybody in the room have an Uncle Louie? Just one. You do. All right, I got, I got to choose another name. I don't know. I think it's somebody. Uh, uncle Albacross. I don't know. But it's some uncle. Can you imagine, though, going to your uncle's funeral? You, you remember standing there at his grave. You, you cried right along with everyone else. You opened the front door. Oh my goodness, there he is. You know, I have to wonder, the Bible doesn't tell you, you have to wonder, do you think anybody had a heart attack when, they, when, they, <laughs> when that happened? Uh, Whoa, where'd you come from? I don't know, Lord resurrected. Beloved, what is that? That is resurrection power. And that's why we sing as believers, I serve what? A risen Savior. And hopefully if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, as your Lord, do you realize what resurrection miracle of power you are? Why do I say that? Think about this. Psalm 51, 5 tells us that we were all born, conceived in sin. And yet, Romans 6, 11 says, despite that, we have, through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, have been what? Made alive to God. You think about this. Ephesians 2, 1 tells us, why, we were dead in our sins. How dead is dead? Dead is dead. But by God's grace through faith, we have been raised up 
Ephesians 2, 6, with Christ. I'm amazed about this truth. It says that we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You know, someone were to say to me, Pastor, you seem a lot, little bit excited here this morning on such a cloudy, rainy day. I'll, say, I'll tell you this much. This message should get you excited. We have reason to give God the glory. You think about this. In the power of the resurrection, God has opened our spiritually blind eyes to be able to see the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb. You think about the power of the resurrection. The resurrection has taken our confused, fleshly minds and by God's grace and by His Spirit has allowed us to perceive the truth, to understand spiritual things. You think about the resurrection power. What has it done for us? For all of us in this room who know Jesus Christ, it is, He has placed within us new life. And to that I say, praise God. Now let's turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Anyway, despite what the Jewish high priest Caiaphas and Annas, the Sanhedrin, and all those in the highest ranking order of Israel, the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, the rabbis, all those who inflamed those in Pilate's court to cry out for Jesus and to say, crucify him, crucify him. And yet these fearless women, among them you might remember Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of Jesus and his half-brothers, uh, mentioned here, James and Joseph, and of course, to our Lord's Aunt Salome as well, just to name a few women. Those women stood by the shadow of the cross, and they were true soldiers, great soldiers in God's kingdom, because they stood by their Lord right up to the end. Well, quite honestly, most of the men had fled the scene. I'll tell you, I mention this because these women were valiant women. They were leaders not by appointment or position, but they were leaders in character. And these women st stood shoulder to shoulder, and their faith and trust and belief, and most importantly, their love for Jesus, moved them to go visit the tomb. Do you remember? And along the way, in carrying their spices, <laughs> they were saying to one another, oh, by the way, there's a rock there. How are we going to get past that? But instead, they would be met by a surprise, wouldn't they? The great rock was rolled away. And there was the angel declaring those beautiful words. Words we declare again today from this pulpit. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. And I'll tell you, that's again why at Christmas time, and I look over and they got that beautiful manger scene. And I like to say to people, Folks, he's not there. Now, it's nice to think about, but he's really not there. And he's not on the cross either. And he's not in the tomb. But he's seated at the right hand of his father. And so, you might remember, these dear women, when they hear this news, what happened? They were told to go tell everyone else, except they didn't. Because, as I suggested, they were probably in shock by all that they saw. But, interestingly enough, Mary Magdalene goes back, doesn't she? She wanders back to the tomb. This is that dear woman who had once been tormented by seven demons, the Bible tells us, and yet the Lord Jesus had delivered her by the word of power. She goes back to the tomb, and there's two friendly angels there to greet her. And again, she hears the same news. He's not here. He's risen. Oh, Mary Magdalene was in such... Uh, for a surprise for her life when she turns around and, why, well, there's a gardener, right? Taking care of the, the whole area. Oh, wait a second. That's not the gardener at all, is it? Because she hears him say, Mary. And when she heard the voice of her Lord, as, it, as the Bible says, the, the sheep hear his voice and they know him. That, that voice of our Lord, Jesus. She realizes it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's alive. Glory be to God. But oh, 
how the human heart can be stubborn, right? In the midst of a beautiful account, and, and here she hears this wonderful news. Verse 11 tells us, look there. She tries to tell them they refuse to believe it. But here's the thing, and it brings us to our little text today. Our Lord's not done appearing. Oh, he's going to show up in a few other places as well. And looking here now at verses 12 and 13, here's what we read. And after that, he appeared in a different form to two of them. While they were walking along on their way to the country, and they went away and reported it to the others. Look at this. But they did not believe them either. Now, this rather short account that Mark gives in just two verses is what I would refer to as the Reader's Digest version. But there is another account given in Luke chapter 24. And I'd like you to turn over there because that's where we're going to find ourselves to expand upon these little two verses. And instead, we're going to read the novel rather than the Reader's Digest version. And it's over in Luke chapter 24, picking up at verse 13. We learn a lot, a lot more. And I just have to say, by the way, not only am I excited about our Lord's resurrection, but this happens to be one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I just love this story when you, it's not too hard to imagine it, uh, it, and especially the way Luke unfolds the whole story. Luke 24, 13, and behold, two of them, uh, just like as Marcus mentioned, were going that very day, now he tells us, to the village Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. So you get the idea here that they're, they're leaving now the great city. And they're heading out, as Mark has said, into the country. But here Luke tells us where they were going. And they were conversing with each other about all the things which had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Here's Jesus, right in front of them. Just like with Mary Magdalene, has no, they have no idea, though, who he is. You might want to wonder, and I don't have an answer to this, why the Lord chose to appear to these two individuals. I'm sure he had his purposes. Verse 16 there says, of course, that they didn't recognize Jesus. And Mark's gospel mentions, by the way, that that Jesus here had now appeared in a different form. I don't know if he altered how he looked, or maybe he dressed differently, because when Mary saw him in the garden, she assumed he was the gardener, maybe by something he was wearing. I, I don't know here, but picking up in verse 17, and he, that is, of course, the Lord Jesus, said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, huh, What a question. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? <laughs> I love sometimes how the Bible unfolds stories. And, you know, as I've mentioned, you know, there's not like little, uh, little more, um, parentheses around some of these verses that say, laughter here now, this is funny or whatever. But I, I, I see a sense of humor in this because I sense that this fellow is asking, of course, the great question of the hour. Hey, where have you been? <laughs> but think about who they're saying this to, who he's asking this of. Where, where have you been? I, I can only imagine what Jesus must, must have been thinking at this point. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, What things? <laughs> what things? What, are they having a sale in the temple again? What, 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 what's, what, what things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene. And by the way, I believe they said it with that, 
with that expression, <laughs> who was a mighty prophet in deed and word and in sight and all the people, and how, watch this, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. Oh, what a statement comes here next. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. What was the hope, beloved, that filled the hearts of these two men? Made them sad, actually. Was that they were obviously individuals who followed Jesus to Nazarene. They, they were hoping beyond hope that Jesus was going to turn out to really be Israel's Messiah. That Jesus really was the promised Redeemer. And, and so they're telling Jesus this, oh, how we had hoped. But that's just it. The, the very thing that they're saying is true. Because Jesus is Israel's Redeemer, just as he's our Redeemer today. And they mention here again in verse 20, it's true. They're Israel's religious leaders, they rejected the Lord and they sent him to Calvary. But in doing so, even they had no idea. And I, I'm I just, just amazed about how God not only can use the good to fulfill his purposes, but even evil to accomplish his ends. They had an evil purpose for sending Christ to Calvary. But God had a great purpose for his son going to Calvary. I'm reminded of that little verse, and sometimes you think to yourself, Boy, that, where, that little verse tucked away somewhere in the book of Job, of all places. Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and that the last he will take his stand on the earth. Isn't there a hymn or something that's written around those words? What is that? That's a prophetic utterance. It's a messianic prediction. And think about this. Here's Job, most likely, who lived thousands of years in advance of the Lord's coming, telling the world, someday he's coming. And when he comes, he's going to be the Redeemer. Psalm 1914, King David, when he was moved by the Spirit of God, wrote, Let the words of my mouth, many of you know this, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. These two men, who were they looking for? They were looking for the redeemer. And here they are on the road to Emmaus. They're looking for the redeemer. And the redeemer comes looking for them. Isaiah 60, 16. You will know that I, the Lord, am your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. And notice here in the middle of verse 21, they make this comment. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Now, I want to tell you, they're not talking about the resurrection. They're talking to who they don't know who he is and saying to him, hey, where have you been the last three days? Huh? Huh? But then they say, but also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, they didn't find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those women were with us. They went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But they didn't see him. Now, what's going on here? There's confusion at this point, massive confusion, because uh, no one's really so sure about what's happened. And of course, you might remember, this played right into the Romans and the Jewish uh, leaders, the religious leaders. It played right into their hands. Why? Because they had worried. It's why the stone was there in the first place, right? They were all worried that the disciples were going to come and steal Jesus' body. And then, you know, create, create this uh, uh, rumor that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. Now, I think to myself, our God's a patient God. He's patient with us. 
But I think at this point, verse 25, uh, Jesus, if he wasn't splitting a gut and laughing to himself or thinking to himself, I don't know, what's whatever, but he said to them, he said to them, verse 25, Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Do you catch what he's saying? Have you read your Bibles? Huh? What has the Bible? One of the things Robert said yesterday, and I'll tell you, it just touched me. You know, he, he held his Bible up, and uh, he said, I believe everything that's in this book. And the way he said it, I believed him. And I thought to myself, if only people would be that way towards the Bible, imagine how we would be changed. And Jesus says here, uh, have you not paid attention to what the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary for the Christ, a reference to Messiah, to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then what does Jesus do? And beginning with Moses... And with all the prophets, what a lesson, what a sermon, what a message that must have been. Wow. Hey, we're going to start in Genesis, and I'm going to roll you all the way through. I think about that sermon series I did years, about, years ago in the book of Genesis, Finding Christ in Genesis. He's there, especially since the New Testament tells us he's the creator. <laughs> So, you know, you go back and you read, Gen he's there. And Jesus takes, he walks them. You know, it's like one of those uh, seminars that people go to walk through the Bible. Jesus, Jesus invented walk through the Bible. He walks these guys through their Bibles and explains all the things about himself in the scriptures. Now, now bear in mind, while he's telling them all this, they still have no idea. They still have no idea. And yet, what that also tells us is that the Old Testament, if it's read the way it should be read and understood, it's pointing to someone. It's leading us to someone. I, I like the fact of how, you know, they mentioned that between the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament, they refer to it as 400 silent years. You familiar with that? And I think how Hebrews 1 says, how in these last days, God hasn't spoken to us through the prophets, but he says, now in these last days has spoken to us in his son. It is to say that God in the beginning with Adam and Eve had communion and fellowship, conversation, relationship, and then we just begin to see it deteriorate, don't we, all across the Old Testament to such a point that this, things just go down the tube, so to speak. And then there's 400 silent years where when we say 400, God's no longer really communicating, not much going on. And yet the next voice that they hear is God himself in flesh. The word has come. I was thinking, I was going through, well, getting my office together this last week, and I was going through some paperwork. And I came across a thank you card. And I think about the ministry of this church. It was from a family thanking me because their, their elderly mother, year, this happened a few years ago, their elderly mother was here in one of our Christmas Eve, um, our candlelight service. And that night she heard the gospel and that Jewish dear woman sat there and realized that the Christ of Christmas was her Messiah. And her son wrote this letter to thank me that, that he prayed with his mother and confirmed with her her newfound faith in Jesus Christ. Imagine these men are traveling along the road and this secret road traveler joins them. And then in verse 28 it says, and they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he would go further. And they urged him, oh, I'm, I imagine at this point they were enjoying themselves. I mean, this guy knows his Bible. Hey, stay with us. Uh, it's getting toward evening. The day is nearly over. And he went in to stay with them. And it came about that when he reclined with them, 
He took the bread and blessed it. Now, you think about this. The context of our Lord having his last supper with his disciples. And, and uh, I'm sure the Lord had done this many times and was known for it. And of course, he took the bread and blessed it. And he, he broke it. And he began giving it to them. You, you, see, you see what's the setup, right? And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. Hey, it's, it's, it's him! And he vanished. He vanished from their sight. All along. Now, you know, the thing of it is, you know where the story's going. But honestly, if you put yourself in the shoes of those two men, can you just imagine? All of a sudden, they realize it really is it really is Jesus. And in verse 32, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? You know what they're saying? Hey, man, there was something happening, wasn't there? Could you feel it? I, I could feel it. There was something about that guy. And they arose that very hour, and they returned to Jerusalem seven miles back. <laughs> I imagine they were in a hurry, and they weren't going to wait, and they found gathered together the 11, remember Judas is gone now, and those who were with them, and saying, the Lord really has risen. <coughs> and they mentioned something else, too, that they must have found out. And he has appeared to Simon. So apparently, when Jesus was talking to the two fellows, he also tells them, oh, I also appeared to Simon Peter as well. You can you mentioned that, right? Well, they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Now, here's the thing. A spirit, a ghost, you understand what I'm saying here, does not eat. But Jesus was right there with them in human form. It also is possible that the one man's name who's mentioned, Cleopas, he may very well have been the husband of one of the women who had visited the tomb. And so he was probably wrestling himself with the whole thing, wondering, you know, is that true or not? And here now they have the witness of these two men. They have the witness of Mary Magdalene. They're all telling the disciples, right, he's risen. And I think, you know, someday, someday the heavens are going to be rolled back like a scroll. Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. I don't hear anything secret about that when it says every eye will see him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Then one last thing, just turn for a moment, let in my spirit to Romans chapter 6, because we've been talking about this resurrection power. Watch this. The Bible tells us, Romans 6, 3, Oh, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. And here's the glorious part. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. And I tell you what, that is resurrection power, Father God. We glorify your name and the power of the resurrection and that we would live in newness of life. As the Bible declares why in Jesus Christ, you, Lord God, have declared us a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Help us to remember that to celebrate that, to rejoice in that, and to glorify your name. We glorify your name, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>